It's question show time. Your questions, my answers. As always, wherever you are on my channel, if a question pops into your brain, I will gather them up and I will answer them here. It doesn't matter which video, I see them all. Uh, before I want to get into this week's question show, I want to remind you that Paul, Matt Sutter, and I are going to be going to Costa Rica in March as part of our Astro Tours. We've done Iceland, we've done the Caribbean, and now we're going to be doing Costa Rica, and it's one of my favorite countries. We're going to be in the jungles, we're going to be checking out volcanoes, we're going to be seeing the wildlife, and we'll also bring a bunch of telescopes along and view the night sky. So if you want to be part of this, I think you've got till the end of December to put in a reservation. Go to astrotours.co and then go down through the list of offerings and you'll see the one where we go to Costa Rica. I'd love to have you join us. Check it out. All right, let's get on with the questions. Nicholas Jackson. If we came up against an extinction event designed to kill humans like alien life, a superbug plague outbreak, or an AI, what is the chance that human society will survive under it? It really all just depends on the kind of existential extinction event we're up against. Uh, and especially sort of as it relates to space exploration, colonizing Mars, things like that. If, if Let's imagine that we do set up a colony on, say, Mars. Then if there's an asteroid strike on Earth, the Martians won't care, although they probably will depend on the supplies. Um, if there's a superbug, they'll just know to like stay away from Earth and don't uh, send any cargo back and forth from the planet. Uh, if there's an AI, of course, computers can absolutely eventually build their own rockets and chase us out into space. So I think of all of those existential threats, the AI one is probably one of the worst ones because we're going to be dealing with an intelligence that is beyond our own and no matter where we try to go it'll chase us down i think that that this this idea of existential threats is going to become more and more serious i mean back in the day the kind of technology that you would need to have to be able to kill all human beings on earth would be like a nuclear arsenal and this was only held by the largest groups of people governments military things like that but as we move forward and the technology to do this kind of stuff gets into the hands of smaller research groups universities eventually it kind of feels inevitable to me that that say developing bioweapons is going to be able to get into the hands of almost any you know, uh, individual who really wants to build a superbug. And so it's really going to be that we're going to have to figure out defenses. If we assume that some of these, you know, an AI or a superbug or things like that are almost inevitable, um, we need to really think about defense. We need to take these kinds of existential threats more seriously. We're more connected as human beings than we ever were, and we should figure out ways to defend ourselves in this kind of connected way. And I hope we figure it out. Random user 311. You don't really need to know your way around the night sky. There are mobile apps like SkyMap that allow you to point your phone at the sky and see the constellations you're pointing at on the screen. Also has a search feature to help you go to. All right, I will agree that these apps are pretty cool. And if you're just like looking up in the sky and go like, I see a bright star, I wonder which planet that is. And then you take your sky app and you point it up and it says, oh, it's Venus. That's cool, um, but if you kind of knew your sky, you wouldn't need an app to tell you which one it is. So, so the, the thing that I find, and this is just for me personally, is I, as I don't find that I, like it's like there's too much information. The app is showing you all of these constellations, they're moving around, and as you, as you move the, the phone around, you're not really understanding what you're looking at. And knowing that the Orion Nebula is in this little location is very different from this deep knowledge that you get as you get a telescope and start to teach yourself the night sky. So I really don't think that there's any replacement for slowly and carefully over, over a long time learning your way across the night sky, recognizing all of the constellations, knowing where the different deep sky objects are in relation to the stars, knowing that if that Andromeda is just by the constellation of Pegasus and there's a bunch of stars and you can walk your way up to where Andromeda is. Like for me, when I look up at the night sky, I I am it is this familiar place where I see in a in a heartbeat. I can see all these stars and then I know where I am and I know where things are and I know how to find things and it's a longer path. Uh, so I, I don't feel like it's the same thing. I think, and, and, and if you get to that point, then the star map apps 
aren't really of any value to you anymore. So I don't think there's any, any real replacement for taking your time to learn the night sky. It's a great hobby. Uh, and once you get a telescope, it just becomes invaluable to be able to find your way around. So check it out. Richard Hayes. If Tunguska had happened 100 years later than when it did, i.e. 2008, do you think the planet would take the threat of impacts from space more seriously? I do. Mm, I don't think so. Um, we had a pretty significant almost impact happen with Chelyabinsk uh, back 2000 and man, how long ago was it? 2007, 2008, um, where you had this fairly significant rock explode in the skies above above Russia. Many people were sent when the shock wave crashed through the atmosphere and it shattered the glass in all of these uh, buildings and, and houses and p several thousand people went to the hospital with with injuries. Uh, and and after that, we heard a lot of fairly enthusiastic planning from governments about asteroid defense and things like that. And then it all just went back to the regular background sound and people were concerned about other <laughs> existential issues that we're dealing with. So, so no, I think, I mean, if Tunguska had hit Russian forest and I don't know if anybody even died. Um, right now, as we're recording this, the largest fire in California history has taken out hundred more than a hundred thousand acres uh, almost a hundred people have died with a thousand people missing and I'll bet it in the end it's not gonna make a big difference to people's reactions to climate change and things like that like like we are we as human beings encounter these enormous events and we tend not to take them that seriously we don't really change the way that we live our lives and we, can, we have this really great tendency to be able to just sort of settle back into just the regular ways that things are. And we worry about the, our jobs and, and our children and our, uh, you know, our neighborhoods and things like that. And we don't really think too much about the big pictures anymore. And our, our governments are just an extension of that. So, so no, I don't think even if an asteroid smacked right into a forest, I don't think people would really take it that seriously beyond a couple of years after it had happened. Robert Brown. Would it be beneficial to launch rockets from the poles, perhaps a more fuel efficient trajectory out of the atmosphere? If you notice, the vast majority of the rocket launch places are close to the equator. And that's because when, you know, the earth is turning and so when your rocket launches, it gets to take advantage of this rotation of the earth to get to space a little bit easier. It allows you to either launch a heavier payload than, when you, than you would normally, or allows you to launch with less fuel than you would need to, or allows you to get to a higher velocity than you would before. And rockets can just barely get into space right now. And so that, that help that you get from launching at the equator is huge. And that's why you see the vast majority of the rockets. Like when you think about the, the Kennedy Space Center, they, they take off and they fly out over the Atlantic Ocean and that's, that's the easiest flight path that you can take. So, so launching rockets from the poles won't give you any advantage. That said, there are some really useful orbits that you can get when you launch from in, in, in what's called a polar orbit. So instead of going around the Earth, uh, around sort of the equator of the Earth, you go north-south. And so you get a, so as you're sort of orbiting around the top of the Earth and the Earth is turning underneath you, you get this really comprehensive view. And so a lot of mapping satellites, some communication satellites, I'm sure some military satellites use this polar orbit. And with those polar orbits, it doesn't matter where you launch from, you can launch from uh, Canada is great. You can launch from, there's a, a space launch place in Sweden. There's ones in Northern Russia. So uh, there is value to those polar orbits, but not as many as launching from the equator. And so there's always going to be a, a demand for polar orbits, but the vast majority of launches will come from the equators. Nishe Shestra. SpaceX and the guys launching the Electron rocket plan to launch satellites every week. One would assume the orbital space is limited. Is there a number of how many launches or satellites would be before the orbital space is saturated? Space is really, really big. Like, I believe uh, Douglas Adams uh, told us how big space was. And 
so really the problem is the amount of space that's really close to the Earth and a fairly low altitude. Once you get a few thousand kilometers above the Earth, space is gigantic. But if you get really close to the Earth, and the bigger issue comes with this idea of the Kessler syndrome where spacecraft will smash into other spacecraft and they will uh, create this sphere of metal that's like a buzzsaw for anything that's trying to move through it. So that's bad. Um, but the um, so, so, part, so part of the solution or part of the issue, you know, space junk is a big problem. And I know that with SpaceX planning to launch 12,000 satellites with their Starlink system, they're going to be launching them into a very low orbit. And so this is the problem is you're in very low orbit, you're running up against the atmosphere, and it's degrading your orbit. And so they're planning to have their spacecraft only last for about five years. So they're going to launch 12,000 satellites. And in the worst case scenario, if they do set up a Kessler syndrome, you just have to wait five years before all those satellites have burned up into the atmosphere, and then you can get out to space again. So I think with all of these new rocket systems that and coming up, there's going to be a much bigger consideration into dealing with the space junk and making sure that either you launch in a low enough orbit that your spacecraft is going to re-enter the atmosphere quickly, or you come up with some system to make sure that your satellite can deorbit itself when it's the end of its mission. And I hope that that is going to be a requirement by all of the countries for anyone who wants to launch a satellite. Chris Barnes, is there life on the moon? Has NASA been covering something up about the moon? <laughs> um, no, there's no life on the moon. The moon is, is the worst. The moon is on the one side, okay, so there's no atmosphere, uh, no one can breathe. Uh, the temperature is extreme. It's either uh, more than 100 degrees centigrade uh, during the daytime or it's in the negatives at the nighttime. So you either fry or you freeze. Uh, there's a constant radiation coming from the sun and, you're, and, and, and galactic cosmic radiation. So uh, now, right now, NASA has. Uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is orbiting around the moon right now, taking really high resolution images of the surface of the moon and can see uh, objects, you know, the, the Apollo landing sites and so on. So, uh, you know, what would it take for NASA to actually cover up life on the moon? So right now, right, then the NASA spacecraft uh, I'm not sure exactly how many images, but it's hundreds of thousands of images have come back from the NASA Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. The European Space Agency Smart One spacecraft was there. There was the Apollo missions. The Russians have sent spacecraft to the moon. The Chinese have one there right now that's on the far side of the moon. It's going to be showing us what the far side of the moon looks like in, in more detail. So it would have to be this world conspiracy with all of these countries all involved in hiding up evidence uh, and really, like, do aliens come all the way? They cross the vast distances from other stars to come here to, like, pile up rocks on the moon? Seems crazy. Anyway, so no, there's no life on the moon. Life's kind of not possible on the moon. And uh, NASA is not covering up any evidence of life on the moon. But, you know, uh, maybe I'm just part of the conspiracy, too. Ken Williams. Ben Rich, the former head of Lockheed Skunk Works, said before he died, we already have the means to get to the stars now. I've been getting a bunch of comments. I did an episode on ion engines and a whole bunch of people have coming out of the woodwork and telling me about the fact that we have anti-gravity and, and high speed uh, engines already and we don't need any of this stuff. Um, that's awesome. Show me. Like, let's just, let's fly some of these spacecraft. Just demonstrate to me that these other things exist. I don't think they do. I think it's just conspiracy theory, conspiracy theory and UFO conspiracy uh, <laughs> theory as well but but um but it, the real simple thing is to let's just assume these things don't exist we'll use ion engines and if somebody can just demonstrate that they've got anti-gravity or uh, a warp drive then we can throw all that in the garbage and use this new technique and if it never shows up because it doesn't exist then we don't have to worry about it so if you believe this stuff is to be true great uh demonstrate it that's it just make your spacecraft fly and then we can throw out all this other incredibly hard work that everybody is doing. Pocahontas. Would it be possible to send several spacecraft out to hundreds, maybe thousands of astronomical units from the sun and have them fall into an extremely distant orbit around the sun with their observational instruments turned back towards the inner solar system and the sun to try and detect the large bodies in the outer solar system, like planets that are otherwise hard to detect due to how dark they are at these distances? 
I think I mentioned this earlier, space is big and the solar system is really, really big. Uh, when you think of, when you look at these pictures of the solar system, say, the Earth, you know, inside the orbit of the Earth, you've got Mercury and Venus. Uh, outside of that, you've got Mars and Jupiter. But still, these are just a tiny fraction of the size of the solar system when you think about how far Pluto is. And then when you think about things like, like Sedna uh, or some of these other um, Haumea, uh, we think about these new objects that are being discovered. And of course, Planet Nine is this theorized object that's even farther. But the problem is that if you move a telescope out to this distance, it still has a long way to look. And you don't know whether you happen to be closer to this object than uh, any other part of the outer solar system. So right now, our best option is to stay right here on Earth to build more and more powerful telescopes and just keep scanning the sky until we find more of these objects. In general, these kinds of discoveries take a whole new generation of space or space or ground based telescope, right? So, so when the newest powerful telescopes were developed, then a bunch of new objects were discovered and then they ran out. And now we're waiting for the large synoptic survey telescope, the extremely large telescope, the 30 meter telescope, the Magellan telescope, James Webb, etc. right? These are going to take us to the next generation of discovery in the outer solar, solar system. And maybe even one of them is going to be the one that finds planet nine. But to actually go out there, it means you're far away from the other side of the solar system. So better to stay right here. Phil Metal. In your opinion, will it take world peace to do some truly meaningful space exploration to industrialize space? I don't think that we will ever have world peace. I think that we will have uh, less war. I think we will have greater uh, uh, sort of better standards of living for more and more people on Earth, lower child mortality, better health outcomes, longer lives. But we're never going to have world peace. We just keep stumbling forward as human beings. And then at the same time, we explore. We explore and we challenge ourselves to where we can get to in the solar system and what kinds of environments we can handle and make these discoveries. And I don't think, I think the two are just mutually exclusive. When you think about the exploration that was done hundreds of years ago, there definitely wasn't world peace. In fact, the nations were at constant war with each other, and yet at the same time, they were exploring the world around them. And I think, let's hope we're not at constant war with each other, but I think that exploration doesn't necessarily require complete and total world peace. Let's just do two, both at the same time. Let's keep working towards less war, more safety and health for as many people on Earth. And at the same time, let's explore the solar system. Steve Tobovich. If Voyager 1 was on Oumuamua's trajectory and we didn't know what it was and it was discovered the same way Oumuamua was, would we be able to tell that it's artificial? If Voyager 1 was on the same trajectory as Oumuamua, we would have no idea that it was there, right? It is so small, like just a few meters across for the main part of the spacecraft. And unless you knew exactly where to look, there'd be no chance that we would even discover it. Um, Oumuamua is probably some, some asteroid that is uh, dozens, if not hundreds of meters across. It's a big object, um, not a solar sail, but a big rock. Um, so, so the reason why we're able to communicate or know where the voyages are is because they are sending radio transmissions at us and we can receive those transmissions. And actually astronomers did scan Oumuamua to see if it was giving off any radio transmissions. And it wasn't. In fact, if there was a cell phone on Oumuamua, the radio telescopes on Earth would have been able to detect it, but they didn't. So, uh, so no, but if it was just like the object Voyager, we would never see it. And that shows you that, in fact, in the far, far future, when Voyager goes potentially through some other star system, it's not going to get found by aliens. It's just going to go through and keep moving. And that's the best it's going to be able to do. Josh M. Hey there, Fraser. When humans colonize Mars, how will they transport themselves across the surface? I mean, what if one colony was in trouble and needed assistance from another? Say they are 200 kilometers apart. What's the best way? A rocket hop? A Zeppelin style airship? A Hyperloop electric train? Or electric cars and trucks, maybe? Just curious about your thoughts about infrastructure and logistics on Mars. When the first colonists arrive on Mars, there's going to be no infrastructure whatsoever. And there's no roads, right? There's um, 
uh, no way really for them to help each other out from colony to colony. The best strategy is to keep your, have just one colony and if you're gonna make another colony, have it right beside your other colony. Um, over time, you can imagine more infrastructure getting built up. I think in the beginning, though, rockets are probably your best bet because of the low atmosphere. You can follow a, a ballistic trajectory and move from one part of the planet to the other. Airplanes can work, uh, assuming you sort of build the right kind of aircraft. And you can imagine later on, they're going to start laying roads in the regolith. They're going to be turning uh, Martian regolith into, into road bases and actually be able to connect up their various places. And eventually you can have trucks or cars or whatever. There's been a couple of, of science fiction stories that have covered this. One is the Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars series. And they talk about sort of a big long journey that has to be made. And they have these, these Martian trucks that they use to drive across the surface. It's a very long journey, like thousands of kilometers. And of course, in the Martian, he has to go uh, several hundred, maybe even several thousand kilometers across the surface of Mars. And it's a very long and slow and complicated with all kinds of very dangerous terrain in, in front of him. So until we have that infrastructure, it's going to be really hard to do. Lalit Sharma, you told in your earlier video that ISS orbit is being slowly lowered and needed to boost regularly to maintain such an orbit then the moon's orbit should also be slowing with time and why will it not collide with the earth again until now you're actually dealing with two different situations here the international space station is orbiting at like an altitude of what like 370 390 kilometers and it's so low that it's actually going through a lot of the atmosphere of the earth and so the atmosphere is really kind of pushing up against it and it's lowering its orbit and so every few months they have to fire the rockets on the spacecraft that are attached to the space station and raise its orbit. They really have to speed up its orbit again so that it won't actually crash back into the atmosphere. The moon is much farther away, right? Around 200,000 kilometers away. Um, and it's not going through any of the Earth's atmosphere. And so the atmosphere is not slowing it down. The reason the moon is it's actually drifting away from us, and that's because the Earth, as the Earth turns and the Moon's gravity interacts with it, the Moon is trying to slow down the rotation of the Earth. It's kind of grabbing onto some irregularities of the, of the Earth's shape. And that as the Earth's rotation is slowed down, the total amount of momentum in the system needs to be conserved. And what the Moon does in response is it slowly drifts away. And so as the Earth's rotation slows down, the Moon drifts away and everything is kept in balance. But we have a situation like Phobos, which is going around Mars. It actually orbits faster than a single day. It takes, I forget, like some number of hours, nine hours, eight hours, um, to orbit around Mars, uh, which is less than a Martian day, which is about the same as, as an Earth day. And what that means is the exact opposite is happening. Phobos is trying to speed up the rotation of Mars because it's sort of going faster than Mars is turning. And what that does is to maintain the momentum the Phobos has to lower its orbit. And eventually, in some time in the far future, 50 million years from now or something, Phobos is eventually going to crash into Mars. So if, we, if the Moon was so close that it orbited around the Earth faster than 24 hours, then the Moon would crash into the Earth. But because it is farther than the amount of time it takes for it to orbit once around the Earth to be the same as our day, then it's going to drift far away. And you're going to see this exact same thing in every other planetary situation. If they're closer than the day length, then they're going to crash in. If they're farther than the day length, then they're going to drift out. And the funny thing is, we only see the moons that are farther away because all the ones that were closer have already crashed into their planets. So uh, there you go. And that's why it's not going to happen. All right, that was it. Uh, the end of your questions. I hope you enjoyed those. They're always so much fun for me. Uh, as always, wherever you are on my channel, if a question pops into your brain, just uh, type them all out and I will gather them up and I'll answer them here. And remember, you should totally join me and Dr. Paul Sutter in Costa Rica. We're gonna have a great time. March 3rd to 10th, 2019. Go to astrotours.co and check it out. All right, we'll see you next week.